Hey, it's Caitlin from C-SPAN. Did you know that C-SPAN has been serving the American people for 45 years? Since our founding in 1979, C-SPAN has been documenting history with a unique approach, unfiltered, without commentary, and entirely independent from government funding. C-SPAN is funded by fees from our cable and satellite distribution partners. And now, with fewer people subscribing to cable and satellite, we're asking you to help support our next 45. Your contribution helps to ensure that we can continue to provide unfiltered, complete coverage of government proceedings on TV, online, on radio, and our mobile app, as well as context through newsletters, social media, and podcasts. Join us in preserving this legacy of access to the democratic process. Make your tax-deductible donation today at cspan.org slash donate. Thank you. On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. And welcome to About Books. This week, we're doing a spring preview to let you know about some of the new books that are being published. Well, in April, thriller writer James Patterson will release this book, The Secret Lives of Booksellers and Librarians. It's a collection of profiles of school and community librarians, as well as booksellers from independent stores to big box chains. The book comes at a time when controversies over book bans are in the news. Mr. Patterson's publisher, Little Brown, describes the book as a, quote, love letter to the heroes of literacy. In a recent interview about the book with Publishers Weekly, James Patterson said, quote, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of libraries and bookstores, and I can tell you this, keeping these places going takes an unbelievable amount of effort. The general public does not appreciate how hard librarians and booksellers work. And also in April, award-winning author Salman Rushdie will release his account of the August 12, 2022 knife attack that nearly took his life. That incident came more than 30 years after the former Iranian leader Ayatollah Khomeini called for Mr. Rushdie to be killed for publishing the book, The Satanic Verses. The British-American novelist was blinded in one eye from the attack that took place during an appearance at a New York art center. Now, Mr. Rushdie's newest book is called Knife, Meditations After an Attempted Murder. And on April 30th, best-selling author Eric Larson will release his latest, The Demon of Unrest. The book focuses on the election of Abraham Lincoln in November of 1860, the April 1861 bombardment of Fort Sumter in South Carolina, and the outbreak of the Civil War. Crown Publishing writes in its preview of the book, quote, drawing on diaries, secret communiques, slave ledgers, and plantation records, Larson gives us a political horror story that captures the forces that led America to the brink. Also this spring, we'll see new books written by politicians, as well as those who have stood in the political spotlight. In May, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem will release No Going Back, the truth on what's wrong with politics and how we move America forward. Governor Noem, of course, has been mentioned as a vice presidential running mate for Donald Trump. Governor Noem's newest book comes two years after the release of her autobiography, Not My First Rodeo, Lessons from the Heartland. Now in June, presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will release his blueprint for improving government. It's titled America's Path, back to moral leadership. Mr. Kennedy has published several books since announcing his presidential bid last year, including the Wuhan cover-up and American Values, Lessons I Learned from My Family. Current and former members of Congress are also releasing books this spring. House Homeland Security Chairman Mark Green will release We Before Me, The Advantage of Putting Others Before Self. The Republican congressman from Tennessee is a physician and retired U.S. Army major who served as a flight surgeon during tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in April, former Hawaii Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard will release her book, 
It's about her decision to leave the Democratic Party to become an independent. Ms. Gabbard ran for president as a Democrat in 2020, but announced that she was leaving the party two years later, saying that it had come under the control of an elitist cabal of warmongers. Her newest book is titled, For Love of Country, Why I Left the Democratic Party. And former Housing and Urban Development Secretary and 2016 presidential candidate, Dr. Ben Carson has a new book coming out in May. It's titled, The Perilous Fight, Overcoming Our Culture's War on the American Family. And retired Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer has a new book out as well. Justice Breyer, who's written over 10 books already, titled his newest, Reading the Constitution, Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism. And speaking of the Supreme Court, college professor Christine Blasey Ford recalls her decision to testify before Congress during the 2018 nomination hearings for Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Her new book is called One Way Back, A Memoir. And also just out, Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates' latest book is about the effort by African-American writers from Frederick Douglass to James Baldwin to write and define the black experience. It's titled The Black Box, Writing the Race. And one more new book that's out we want to tell you about. Lawyer and retired Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz's latest is called War on Woke, Why the New McCarthyism is More Dangerous Than the Old. And this is about books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. In this episode, we're looking at some of the new books that are coming out this spring. Here are some by journalists. In April, Chicago Tribune investigative reporter Gregory Royal Pratt is releasing his book on the Windy City and its former mayor. The title, The City is Up for Grabs, How Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot Led and Lost a City in Crisis. And in May, Clinton White House Communications Director and current ABC host George Stephanopoulos will release The Situation Room the inside story of presidents in crisis. And the newest book from Washington Examiner political columnist Timothy Carney is titled Family Unfriendly, How Our Culture Made Raising Kids Much Harder Than It Needs to Be. And one more, Fox News host Jesse Waters. His latest is called Get It Together, Troubling Tales from the Liberal Fringe. And we should note that there's a new book coming out about a journalist. USA Today's Susan Page has written a new biography about one of the most well-known broadcasters in history, Barbara Walters. The book, which will be released in April, is titled The Rule Breaker. Susan Page's previous bestsellers were about former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and First Lady Barbara Bush. Now, as we continue our spring book preview, here are some notable upcoming titles about foreign policy. CNN's Fareed Zakaria will release his look at instability in the international order. It's called Age of Revolutions, Progress and Backlash from 1600 to the President. An American military historian, Victor Davis Hanson, will release his latest in May It's called The End of Everything, How Wars Descend into Annihilation. New York Times White House and National Security Correspondent David Sanger, along with the Wilson Center's Mary Brooks, penned New Cold Wars, China's Rise, Russia's Invasion, and America's Struggle to Defend the West. That book also comes out in April. And Catholic University professor and Russian expert Michael Kimmich has penned a study of the Russia-Ukraine war. It's titled Collisions, the origins of the war in Ukraine and the new global instability. And finally, two other notable books we wanna mention that are coming out this spring. In May, former University of Kentucky swimmer Riley Gaines will release her book. It's about her work to keep trans women from competing in the women's divisions of sports. The book is titled Swimming Against the Current, fighting for common sense in a world that's lost its mind. And WNBA star and Olympic gold medalist Brittany Griner is publishing a book about the 10 months she spent in Russia's prison system. 
Ms. Greiner's book entitled Coming Home is being published in May as well. And that's a look at some of the upcoming books this spring. We should note that all of these books will be featured on Book TV in the coming weeks. And now a conversation with National Book Critics Circle board member J. Howard Rozier about the nonfiction books that he's looking forward to in the coming months. So Mr. Rozier, how did you get into the book review business? Um, the joke I always tell is that I always wanted to be a critic, but I didn't really know what that meant. I um, was an undergrad at uh, Columbia College in Chicago, and I was in the journalism program, but my concentration was magazine writing. And so I was doing a lot of uh, like feature writing, but what I liked to read was you know, the New York Review of Books, back of the book stuff for uh, the New Republic, the old New Republic. And um, fast forward several years later, when I got my master's in creative writing from the Art Institute in Chicago, I um, was a critic at the arts paper, the art, sorry, art critic at the school's paper. And um, I wound up on a whim applying to the Emerging Critics Fellowship at the National Book Critics Circle. And I learned a lot from my mentors there. And, you know, a few years later down the line, I found myself on the board, which is still feels crazy. But um, it's been a, the long way around. I wasn't a straight path at all. What is the National Book Critics Circle? We are a critics run organization that seeks to promote literature and literacy uh, in the U.S. Although we have recently launched a translation prize that I believe is in its third year. Um, we are not funded by any publishers. Uh, we're purely independent, so we like to believe that that allows us like latitude in terms of judgment, but also um, independence as far as uh, and uniqueness as far as titles. We like to think our lists are a little more um, unruly than other lists, just because there's 24 people in a room arguing <laughs> about books all year. And every year the Book uh, Critic Circle gives out awards as well, right? We do. We give out awards in criticism, nonfiction, um, fiction, poetry, and autobiography. We also have a first book prize named after the late John Leonard. Um, and we also have um, service awards for people who have done uh, tremendous acts of service on behalf of the NBCC, as well as institutions and uh, literature and culture more broadly. And Book TV covers those awards every year. Mr. Rozier, when people hear the word critic, they think critical often. Is that is that a fair comparison? Um, I think so. Uh, I like to think of my own writing though as exuberantly neutral. Like I'm not trying to heavily praise or heavily slam a book. I just want to think very deeply and intently about the artist is doing and try to explain to the reader why that moves me or why it doesn't. Um, but yeah, I guess that requires a bit of uh, uh, like, you know, tearing things apart, lots of dog ears and book darts and all that post-its. So what makes a good review and what do you see as a mistake in reviewing a book? Um, well, that's a good question. You know, when I talk to my students, um, because I come from a hard news uh, background, there's this idea of uh, balance, right? But I think often in a review, um, when a review feels out of balance, it's these competing interests or uh, tensions that are out of whack. So is criticism kind of sliding into cynicism? Is like fandom um, sliding into praise? And so I think um, the best criticism kind of balances those impulses and explains them in a way that's honest and uh, which is really the most important part, but also like a fidelity to the material, like the auxiliary reading, uh, which there's a lot of that, uh, it really informs um, what you're doing, but only in so much as that the book itself needs more um, like knowledge on a few to land the plane. I, did that make sense? It, it certainly does. Um, when it comes to genre, do you have a personal favorite? 
No, no, I um my career is all over the place. I've written about visual art, um poetry, nonfiction, fiction, uh translation, essay collections, uh biographies. Like I'm 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 literally all over the place. So so long as it's interesting, I'll try to uh write about it well. The trouble is it's hard for me to come up with uh a formulaic or template for things I have to kind of start anew every time I write an essay but that's a good problem to have because I would hope that it would show that um each book is different and that each approach to uh like writing is unique per book actually one of the things that I like doing with the National Book Critics Circle is uh talking about three or four books uh by different review or, or three or four reviews um of a single book and kind of discussing with the membership what it means uh, to write that way and how the different authors came to these different viewpoints on the same title. Justin Howard Rozier, when you review a book and you're reading it, do you take notes as you go? Um, I do, and then the notes, I build out the uh, review from the notes. Um, Usually in my phone, uh, if I'm being honest, I don't take a lot of handwritten notes. I just jot down stuff in the notes app and then I'll copy and paste that in a, a Google Doc and then I'll just build around that. Uh, but I'm always thinking about writing even when I'm not writing. So oftentimes they were doing the dishes or like taking a walk. I'm just thinking about how I can explain how, why this book is worth uh, a reader's time. And so it's not easy, but I think it's manageable, I'll say, where it's I can just gradually turn like a couple hundred words into two or three thousand words, hopefully by my deadline. Well, we invited you on about books to talk about some of the spring books that are coming up that you're interested in. What are some of those books? Yeah, there's a lot of good ones. Um, I tried to bring a pretty diverse list because I do like read and write about a lot of different things. Um, I'm really into Lauren Euler's book, No Judgment, which comes out uh, very soon. Um, she's a Berlin-based critic and novelist, uh, most prominently in The New Yorker, Harper's London Review of Books. And she has a reputation as a critic who says things up that other people are afraid to, particularly about popular books or novelists. Um, I don't think that's an unfair assessment, but I think the trouble is that um, focusing on this kind of obfuscates her humor and the intelligence with which she constructs her pieces. And so this book doesn't really focus on singular uh, like writers. It kind of focuses on issues in the culture at large. Um, and I think it really allows this, this sort of wit and intelligence in her writing to shine. Um, there is a ton of great essays in the collection, I believe a collection of seven essays, but the standouts to me are a rumination on gossip that takes uh, Gawker as kind of the test case in the literary world. Um, a recent New Yorker piece about anxiety. Um, it was actually in the New Yorker and how she handles her own anxiety that kind of takes on sort of frantic pace of anxiety and she justifies at the end by saying, my catharsis is your boredom. I hope I'm not butchering that quote. But I thought it was like such a lovely way to justify her pacing in that. And also a really great piece on uh, the term autofiction, uh, which I sort of quarrel with as a, a genre. It's seen as a pejorative nowadays for a lot of writers. But she very warily... Um, very uh, trenchantly explains why this is actually a novel approach to uh, fiction writing. So that's a, a great book, and for that, sure. And that's Lauren Euler's No Judgment Essays. What's another book that you're interested in this spring? Oh, um, There's Always This Year by Hanif Abdurraqib. Uh, that comes out uh, later in the month. Um, terrific writer from Columbus, Ohio. Um, MacArthur Fellow recently has also been a National Book Critics Circle finalist for his book called Go Out in the Rain, uh, Go Ahead in the Rain by, uh, it's about a tribe called Quest. Um, it's been a finalist for uh, the National Book Award and a long list for the National Book Award. I don't want to predict the future, but I feel like it might be um, 
another one of those. It's a really fantastic book about basketball. Um, but that's like saying the Odyssey is about ships. Um, it's basketball. It's a reflection of life, uh, class and racial divides, individual struggles, familial politics. Um, all of his books are really unique structurally. Um, this one counts down in segments the way a basketball game clock would. Um, and then it features these elegaic timeout sections that resurrect famous Ohioans, both popular and forgotten. And then there's these really startling interludes that are critical appraisals of uh, famous basketball films. So that was kind of a tour de force. I strongly recommend that one as well. And you also put on your list Jesse McCarthy. Yes, a uh, professor of, Engl of English and African American Studies at Harvard. Uh, Great critic, uh, great novelist as well. Uh, recent Widen Award winner for his last book, uh, Who Will Pay Reparations on My Soul. Uh, this is a critical survey, actually. Uh, though I don't want to sell it short. It's actually a really uh, smart uh, revisionist history that seeks to quarrel with this binary of Cold War politics, uh, specifically how it impacted black writers. Um, there's this perception he's trying to capture where the feeling of being martyred in you know American uh, culture and then this feeling of being used by Soviet communism an example of why the American system is failing kind of led black writers to search for a more autonomous and individualist paths with their aesthetics um, the title is a reference to Miles Davis in the 50s and the idea that his music was more cerebral, like the pausing um, and the sort of searching of his notes, the brevity was sort of a reflection of uh, thought um, rather than like a sort of a straight musical theoretical approach. And he kind of, McCarthy kind of looks at um, Richard Wright and Gwendolyn Brooks, James Baldwin, as well as writers who aren't really um, known, such as Vincent O. Carter, um, with this sort of sense of thoughtfulness about the impact of their work within uh, this Cold War binary. Um, Ralph Ellison is not featured in the book, but he does, the specter of it kind of factors uh, pretty heavily, the sort of idea of being underground, for having not been seen, um, and how that haunts uh, the book by the author's own admission uh, like the reason why these writers or their motivation for the book is this idea of not being seen um, by the society at large and this is what's caused them to seek out these individual autonomous modes within uh, the Cold War framework and that is Jesse McCarthy's upcoming book The Blue Period Black Writing in the Early Cold War why do you think he calls it The Blue Period um, it's a reference to Miles Davis, um, specifically the sort of 50s work that's leading into kind of blue, um, and this idea that, um, you think it's one thing with Miles Davis where the brevity of his music is a theoretical, music theoretical framework, but in reality, what he's doing is sort of allowing, um, his like scales and his notes reflect the act of thinking. Um, and so overarchingly, it's a book about thinking differently of, about uh, art and black art specifically. So that's the title is a homage uh, to that. Justin Howard, Rozier, is it tough to be a critic and be based in Chicago and not New York, the center of book publishing? You know, um, I feel forlorn for not seeing friends of mine and um, not be able to go to parties and stuff, but most of my writing appears in magazines in New York, so it's not that hard uh, for me. Um, I would say, though, that initially it was harder to get a look because I'm not hanging out as much, or I am, but um, I hang out in Chicago. But my wife is from New York, so I'm back and forth pretty often. And also, uh, I co-curate a reading series in Chicago called Exhibit B, and we do show the New York uh, two or three times a year. Uh, 
usually for, with the Center for Fiction. We also do stuff for New York Poetry Festival. So I'm there often enough. But um, for me, it's just hard because I miss my friends, a lot of which happen to live in Brooklyn. Is there a book in you? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I've been working on a novel for quite a while. I'm still working on it, Problems That Persist. And I'm actually looking at taking an essay that I wrote about um, Roger Reeves' book, Dark Days, and turning that into a book. It was basically, the theory was kind of looking at the summer of 2020 as year zero, just in terms of how that changed, how uh, black writers sort of perceived their responsibility, whether or not on the liberal side that the summer of 2020 didn't go far enough, or on the conservative side, whether the loss of social order ended up being more harmful than good. Um, and so I would like to write a book that I'm like gradually tinkering away at, uh, more slowly than my novel, to be honest, about um, how black literature just come to resemble, um, has been reconfigured by uh, the events that happened in the summer of 2020 with you know the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, so hopefully I can finish one of them soon. Well, I wanna ask you about another book on your list of upcoming spring books, Mohammed Amir Mazian. Yes, yes, this is a terrific uh, revisionist history called The States of the Earth, um, an ecological and racial history of secularization. Uh, very long title, but um, one of the most interesting uh, nonfiction books I've read so far. Um, the transition from uh, you know, religious states and protein Christianity uh, to more secular states and politics. I see this one of the great triumphs of uh, the world. But when you factor in colonialization, um, according to the author, what we're left with is this Trojan horse for what the author uh, refers to as racial capitalism or the idea that uh, the capitalist structure is discriminatory and oppressive to marginalized people by design. And so we argue that there's a direct correlation with these systems and also the fraught ecological state that we find ourselves in. Really interesting book um, that focuses on Africa, North Africa mostly, but there's some good writing toward the end on Western Europe as well that brings the ideas of the book full circle. Uh, one from one of my favorite presses, uh, Verso, um, lots of uh, left of center leftist works that kind of rethink a lot of preconceived notions about politics in America and the West. So when, uh, I'll shout them out as well. When you read books or look for books, is left of center important to you? No, no. Um, actually, one of the pieces I'm working on right now is about uh, the conservative uh, commentator, Glenn Lowry, his memoir that's coming out in May. I'm working on a long essay about that and the orbit of black conservatives uh, that have sort of coalesced around him on the internet and his uh, podcast, The Blend Show. I'm just looking for something that's interesting. If I'm being transparent, um, my politics definitely runs, uh, I'm more to the left than I am to the right, certainly, but um, I don't really focus on political bias or the culture as when I'm writing. I'm just like, is this interesting to me uh, for better or for worse and why? And then the, the second part, which I think I mentioned earlier, is explaining to the, the reader why that is and why they should spend some time reading. Justin Howard Rozier of the National Book Critics Circle, thanks for spending some time with us on Book TV. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for the invite. Well, thanks for joining us for About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. Book TV will continue to bring you publishing news and author programs and a reminder that you can get this podcast on the C-SPAN Now app. You can also watch online anytime all of Book TV's programs at booktv.org.